します。Going through the medial canthus, you cut it and then you retract and go into the medial wall. This is the anterior uh, thromboidal artery. And when it's, once you finish the, 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 the accession, then you have to reconstruct. So you have to reconstruct the dura, you need to reconstruct the cranoplasty, do cranoplasty, and do in general orbital reconstruction. Do we need orbital reconstruction? Let me refer you to people who did lots of orbital tumor. And the famous one of them is my friend, Joseph Maron from Lebanon, who lives in the practice in the United States. He's retired now. He published uh, this paper a long time ago, about 200 cases of orbital tumors back in 94. The Monty back in 2002, 56 cases. Talashi back in 2014, 47 cases. What did they say? No need for orbital construction, regardless whether the bilateral orbiter is invaded or not. Some people would disagree with that. If you invade the, or if you go through the bilateral orbiter and lots of it is damaged, then you may need to do reconstruction. But these are people who have done lots of cases and they don't advocate reconstruction if the bilateral orbiter is invaded. What about the general papers publication and these cases, renal orbit? Mor mortality, zero to 4%. Cross total resection, Simpson grade two. You cannot speak about Simpson grade one here in the orbit. So you speak about Simpson grade two, just like you don't speak about Simpson grade one in vitroclive and meningiomas. So it's a gross total resection. Uh, 33 to 83, this is the general uh, publications and the current state, as I said, is still high. Uh, and during surgery for this tumor, <clears throat> And because most of them they present with visual deterioration, you may need to open an optic canal to decompress the uh, nerve. Uh, is there a good visual outcome from these cases? Let's see. This paper back in 2005, 25 patients, 18 patients were unchanged. So whatever visual fields they have, whatever visual acuity they have, <clears throat> it did not change. Another paper, 71 patients by Miron, 2009, eight patients unchanged, but 60 patients improved, so it's variable. And I think it depends on the surgical dexterity of the surgeon, but also depends on how much time the optic nerve was compressed. Is there a place for endoscopy in these cases? Yes, and endoscopy, I keep saying, and I keep telling the young generation, in the hands of the, uh, the endoscopist lies the future of neurosurgery. They are really pushing the envelope and we are seeing lots of progress in that, in that uh, field. So this is a look at the uh, left orbit and you can see the severe or the, the, the optic canal and the annulus of the zen. And then if you go here into the lateral orbital wall and drill it, then you will get into the medial fossa dura. You go here, you'll go to the frontal fossa dura. And then you have these two landmarks, the severe orbital fissure and the inferior orbital fissure. This paper, 2018 recent paper, by a group of uh, uh, endoscopists uh, led by Paolo Cababianca from Italy. And uh, they have looked at where to go through the orbit. This is the frontal, this is the temporal. And here, if you want to go into the medial compartment of the orbit, so it's a beautiful view and beautiful cadaveric studies they have done. As I said, they're really pushing the envelope and they will take neurosurgery into highest that was never reached before. Uh, so this is the frontal lobe, temporal lobe, and you can see the sylvian fissure and you can see the approach there for the endoscopist. Uh, so they call it endoscopic superior eyelid transorbital approach, as you can see. Another paper, by a group of endoscopists and surgeons. Joseph Maron is the leading man in the world of orbital surgery. And he joined forces with the endoscopists, Paul Gardner, Schneiderman with Miranda, the ENT surgeon. They joined together to form this round the clock surgical access to the orbit. They published this back 2015. And you can see they can say they can reach to any part of the orbit. Another endoscopy, 2009, this is a recent paper, 2019, uh, trans, uh, 
eyelid, then you go inside, extract the globe, adrenal the wall, you can see the middle fossa here, and then the reconstruction. This is an example they published. This is the tumor of a serene orbital meningioma. Indeed, it is not a complete excision, but they have done a good job there. And this is the bony uh, work they have done. Another paper from Japan, 2015, reaching to the orbit through the frontal sinus, through the small sinus, the maxillary sinus, and so on. What about radiation? Does it have a place here in this sphere of orbital meningiomas? Uh, some papers I uh, collected uh, uh, using the radiotherapy or radiosurgery for these sphere orbital tumors. In general, topic is still controversial. When to give early, late, and how to give. So people are divided between early radiation and delayed radiation. That is not upfront, but after surgery. If you have residual or recurrence, then would you give radiation and would you give it now or later on? That's the vision. So many studies show that delaying radiotherapy does not compromise the patient survival. 2015. So they say, well, delay it, don't worry. Some people say, no, give it early and follow them up because this would significantly improve their outcome with radiation. What well, type of radiation is different from one institute to the other, whether it is external beam or intensity modulated or intensity modulated brachytherapy, brachytherapy, proton beam, and gamma knife. So the take home message from these radiation therapy treatment for these sphere orbital meningioma is judicious use of, uh, of radiation for proven residual or recurrence. I repeat, residual or recurrence not up front. Lots of people, because they don't have the experience of doing the surgery, they do what they want, not what the patient needs. Patient needs surgery, and if there is recurrence, then give radiation. Those people work for themselves. They don't know how to do the surgery, so they treat with radiation. This is mediocre surgeons that are using radiation for their own benefit. Now, my series of these uh, cases, 55 cases, over a period between 1990 till 2020. And these are females more than males as expected. Uh, somehow they were more on the left side than the right side. I don't know why. And I had bilateral in two cases. So this is one of them bilateral. You can see here and there. What was the presentation in my series? Again, the same, proptosis comes first, visual and cranial nerve palsy. What is the rate? Prog progressive proptosis, 47 out of 55. Majority, 85%. Optic nerve involvement, 70%. Cranial nerve deficits, 15%. Seizures, three out of 55. When you get a patient with phenol orbital meningioma and proptosis, you examine the eye uh, movements, each eye separately, this is the right eye separately, and then left eye separately, and then the conjugate eye movements and the staccato eye movements and the so eye movements. So you do all of these eye movements separately and then together. And then you go for assessment of the visual acuity, feet, fundoscopy, optic nerve, OCT, and exothermal measurement. You need to do exothermal measurement before surgery so that when you do surgery, you can see the improvement. So you say uh, the exothermos was 15 millimeter, now it is two millimeter, whatever. So these are the investigations that we mentioned, the fundoscopy, the visual fields. And here in this patient, there is complete loss of vision here in this eye. And uh, what we use uh, in my department that we combine the visual acuity and the visual field defect. This is following the German school of ophthalmology instead of speaking about visual acuity and defect, you put them together for right eye, for left eye, you come with a score, visual field, the right eye, left eye, come with a score, and then you combine 35, 22, then we have 57 visual score uh, that uh, either increased or decreased after surgery. Optic OCT is very important to see any atrophy of the nerve fibers. Again, this is a measurement of progress, a measurement of possibility of recovery or not. 
Proptos is as such, anybody, if you look at him from the front, uh, you're looking at his face, face to face, then you can appreciate the proptosis uh, easily. So you can uh, know them exactly the first look. But the best way to see the, the, uh, the proptosis is by looking from the top of the head of the patient. And you can see, appreciate even the slightest increase in the proptosis. These are examples. You may miss this if you look at the face of the patient, but you will not miss this if you look from the top of the head of the patient. Also, there are measurements. Here, if you draw this line from the anterior part of the zygomatic process and measure it to the lens, then you'll find what is the millimeter. There's no difference here. Or you measure it this way and go into the lens and then see whether there are any difference. In this case, there was difference of 5.8 millimeter. And this is the so-called Frankfurt line from the greater wing of a sphenoid. You see the uh, protrusion of the eye. Let me take you through the images that we had for my cases, the 55 cases. Uh, we do CT scan for them, and that's to show the bony involvement of the orbit, as you can see here. And as you can see here, so also you can compare the pre-op and the post-op. As I said, all these cases are mine, my series. So this is pre-op, this is post-op. You know that you have done a good job here by seeing that you have removed the tumor. So CT is important to see the extent of the bony involvement and to see how much have you achieved during surgery. Again here, anterior clinoid is very much involved. Optic canal is very much involved. This is foramen ovale, and this is the canal for the median nerve. And you can see here, compare this with this, I have opened the optic canal and we have re reduced the tumor in troubles. 3D CT can show you the extent of the lesion. MRI, of course, is the best, and it would show you this. Um, one important view is this, the T2 one. You can see here normal, where the optic nerve surrounded by the subarachnoid space here. It is not. So this optic nerve is definitely involved. And if I'm going to do surgery, I have to open the optic canal. Angiography is important. I'm interested in the ophthalmic artery to see the relationship in the orbit. In this particular case, this is abnormal tumor here. Here is this normal carotid artery. And this is the ophthalmic artery underneath the optic nerve, going laterally, jumping on top going to the middle side to divide into anterior and posterior ethmoid, posterior and anterior ethmoid arteries here. We don't see it, so we know that it is involved. Venography is also important to see if there's any venous drainage. In this case of a tumor, there was a venous drainage into the cavernous sinus. Isotope can be helpful. This is the tumor here, sphenoorbital meningioma, and you can see how it appears on the isotope done by our friend Farid al who is a, a nuclear medicine consultant here in Amman. The same here is the isotope scan. So in my series, what were the structures involved in these cases? All the images I'm going to show you are from my series. None is taken from a book or from any other paper. In my cases, I have seen orbital roof involved. Look at this. All this is a tumor, bone and soft tumor. Lateral wall with involvement of the lateral rectus. Orbital apex. Intracone. So the tumor has extended into inside the cone of the muscles. Severe orbital fissure. Compare this to this. Anterior clinoid process is involved. This is the optic canal optic canal being surrounded by a tumor. Optic canal here, as you can see, and you can judge that it is definitely involved. You can see it here, the tumor is around the right optic nerve. <clears throat> you may find the whole orbit is involved. It's in the roof and the floor and everywhere. You may find the tumor extending into the cavernous sinus. Air sinuses cases, 
going into the frontal air sinus, going to the ethmoidal air sinus, going to the sphenoid air sinus, and going into the maxilla. Frontal bone is involved, as you can see. Temporal bone is involved. Temporalis muscle is invaded. Again, I'm showing you this so that we will not underestimate these meningiomas. Lots of young generation junior neurosurgeons, they think of meningiomas as good. Meningiomas are not good. Meningiomas are difficult to treat and you don't, you cannot underestimate their aggressiveness once they left without treatment. And your hair, you'll find always a long dural tail, as you can see, and this has to be removed during surgery. Look at this tumor here, here, and temporal here, and in here. You may find a small subcutaneous nodule extending from the tumor, like this one. You may find the floor of the middle fossa is involved. This is one of my cases. And this too, the infratemporal fossa involvement. Pterygopalatine fossa, look at this. The anterior clinoid, the body bisphenoid, and then going into the pterygoid plates and pterygopalatine fossa. They can go cause brain invasion. And I will show you some of the slides of my cases where the brain was invaded. And when you face such a case, you are lost because you can do nothing. Even if you do an occlusion of the eye, this patient is gone. It is invaded everywhere. Once you see the sphenol uh, um, orbital meningioma, what is your differential diagnosis? It's so varied, but each and every picture of these would tell you, slow down and think once, twice, and three times before you just jump onto conclusions. Look at this, metastasis, very much like sphenoorbital meningioma, neurofibroma, sarcoidosis, thyroid orbitopathy, fibrous dysplasia, lymphoma, lymphoma is a forgotten disease, rhabdomyosarcoma, as you said, sphenoorbital meningiomas, cavernoma, lacrimal adenocarcinoma, laterally here, optic meningioma, hemangiopericytoma looks like a meningioma, Optic glioma, encephalus trauma with the brain herniating into the orbit, osteoma, dermoid, plasmocytoma, and rhabdomyosarcoma, lymphangioma, cellulitis, pseudotumor, aneurysmal bone cyst, budget disease of the bone, meningioma intracornal, Wagner or Wagner granulomas, pachymeningitis hypertrophica, which is an IgG. Uh, kind of disease, histocytosis X, they love this part of anatomy. <clears throat> so the French diagnosis is very wide. In, in my cases, uh, you have seen the extension, so you have to be open-minded about differential diagnosis. What exactly did we choose as a way of approach for our surgical uh, patients? Uh, I love to have the large frontotemporal uh, craniotomy. It's either Terrional or a variation of the terrional, especially the Dolan's approach with its variations. Uh, extradural drilling, you start with extradural drilling, you drill the bone, and then you do intradural drilling if necessary. You go into the intradural tumor, into the orbit tumor, and you do reconstruction. I use the navigation uh, system to help me through. And in this case, one would know where exactly we are. We are at the superior orbital fissure, exactly. So this, you not, don't need to shave the head. Uh, you raise the flap. And as you raise the flap, you will have tumor that comes out with the bone flap. And this you have to drill. So you start the drilling of the greater wing of the This is temporal, this is the frontal, this is the greater wing. You open the uh, lateral wall and the roof of the orbit. So this is frontal, temporal. We've removed the roof and the lateral of the orbit. This is the greater wing of sphenoid. You continue this way to come to the severe orbital fissure and come this way to the optic canal. Coming here to the anterior clinoid, you drill it. 
same thing here. So you take the core of the uh, of the of the anterior clinoid process, and here you have opened the severe orbital fissure. And sometimes, if you want to to see that the uh, periorbital is invaded or the lateral rectus is invaded, we put a suture around the lateral rectus and we pull it during surgery to see whether the tumor has invaded the lateral rectus or not. This is one of the pictures of our patients. So again, here we have drilled the sphenoid wing, the frontal and temporal dura. Having done the uh, tumor part of the orbit, you open the dura. And then you come across the tumor here. Uh, this is the anterior clinoid or what's left of it. You can cut the dura on top of it. You drill whatever is left of the anterior clinoid intradurally. This is the optic nerve and this is the carotid artery. Here is the third nerve. And then you remove the last piece of the, which is the, usually the most difficult part to remove. Sometimes it's really angulated and difficult. And if it is really sharp, you may open the carotid here. So it has to be done carefully. Again, optic nerve, falciform ligament has been opened, the optic canal has been opened. So this is the roof of the uh, cavernous sinus where the anterior clinoid was. Having done that, you open the drill, the optic canal and open the dura around it and continue removing whatever is left of the tumor carotid and uh, sorry, optic nerve carotid. This is the posterior communicating. So this is eventually the part, the optic nerve is freed, the optic canal is opened, spear orbital fissure has been opened and you have removed the tumor completely. This is the sphenoparietal uh, sinus, the draining the superficial middle cerebral vein. And then you suture the dura whenever you can. As, as such, you can put a glue or artificial dura if you like, and then reconstruct the bone and as you can see, the reconstruction here post-operatively. This is for the bony part, not for the orbital part. And these are the pictures. You can see the superior and lateral wall uh, decompression. And when you come to the histopathology, taking these specimens to the histopathologist, I'm always helped by my colleague and friend, Hassan Farsakh. He's American boarded, and he is brilliant at that. We've been working for dogs years together and he would give you the best of the histology assessment, the usual slides of uh, meningioma, the uh, immunostaining, DMA here is positive, theta membrane antigen, the GFAP is negative, P53 is negative, which is good. Progesterone, the more progesterone you have, the better, 30% or more is better. In this case, 90%, it's good. It's good indicator. Ki67, the lower, the better, 3% in this case. And sometimes, as I said, you will find tumor invading the skeletal muscle. So these are meningioma cells going into the skeletal muscles. You will find bony invasion by the tumor cells. You will find brain invasion. So this is tumor, this is brain invading the brain. Brain invasion does not mean that this is cancer. It does not mean that this has been germ grade three, but this is not a grade one. This is most of the time grade two. But I have seen cases where the brain invasion was just the grade one. So looked at the, our material and we found that 32 were grade one, 20 were grade two, and three were bad, very bad grade three. So this is a grade one. There is bony invasion, but it's still called the gray one. Bony invasion does not mean that it is grade two or grade three. Bone invasion is part of this tumor. Ki67 is low, progesterone is high, and this is positive. While in grade three, you'll find high Ki67, P53 is positive, MA is positive, there is necrosis, and there is high mitotic figures. We published this, myself and my friend Abu Farsakh, uh, we published the last consecutive 250 million germs we worked together and we came with very interesting conclusions. Although many germs are commonest in females than males, yet 
we found that grade one in our series was more in females, while grade two and three is more in females. So the aggressive forms of these meningiomas are more in males. And we discovered also that the lower progesterone which is the worst prognosis, the higher P53, the worst prognosis, the higher KI is the worst prognosis. Did we have any mortality in our series? The answer is no. How much did we achieve? Gross total resection in 44, subtotal in 11. And we had in both groups recurrence of 11. And we looked at the gross total, how many recurrence? Three out of 44. Subtotal, how many recurrence? Eight out of 11. So together we had 11 recurrences in the period between three to eight years after surgery. So what did we do with these recurrences, 11 recurrences? We observed there was no progression on three while it progressed in eight. What did we do with those that progressed? We again went to surgery in two, we gave radiotherapy, surgery and radiotherapy in three. Did we have any recurrence? As I said, yes. And this is one of the cases I want to share it with you. This is a 35 year old female patient from Palestine, Palestinian Authority with this tumor, as you can see, which we operated, we removed it, we've done a good job. And this is the patient recovering well. It turned out to be grade two uh, meningioma. We gave radiation and three years pass up, there's no recurrence. Eight years later, there's no change. Did we have any improvement in the, uh, um, the presentations of these patients? The answer is yes. Proptosis improved in 72%, occular braces improved in 40%. <clears throat> did we have any complications? Of course we did. Ocular motor palsy, that was temporary in three, permanent in one. Levator palpebri superioris, temporary uh, palsy in three and permanent in zero. Examples, this patient with this tumor, this is immediate past up, remained like this for three months and then opened up again. You can compare this with this. Also this patient with this lift proptosis, post relatively ptosis, and then recovery. So if you really did not damage the ocular motor, you did not damage the uh, levator papillary superioris, then this is mechanical due to trauma and hematoma. It will disappear within three to six months. Did we have any improvement in the visual outcome? Yes. Here, 33 out of the 55 improved, but again, 21, they were unchanged because they had the compression of the optic nerve for a long period of time. Other complications like DVT, subgadial collection, CSF fistula, et cetera, were there. And this is one of the complications, osteomyelitis here and empyema, and this was an ischemic incident. <laughs> Let me show you some of the illustrative cases before we go into the final videos. I will go through quickly with these. Uh, this is a patient who is a Jordanian residing in Arab Emirates. She came up with the right side pulsating and painless proptosis. Again, the examination of each eye separately. And this is the bilateral uh, type of uh, sphenoorbital meningioma. We dealt with this one. So this is the CT showing the extent of this tumor and seven years follow up without radiation showed that we have done a good job and there was no recurrence without radiation with good functional outcome. This is seven years follow up. Again, here you can see the opening of the severe orbital fissure and the opening of the optic canal and drilling of the anterior clinoid. Another case of this lady who also came from the Palestinian Authority, 49 year old female patient. Again, the best of you to see the proptosis. And this was an extensive tumor involving the middle fossa and the cavernous sinus. Look at the middle cerebral artery is going up, being shifted by the tumor and the tumor is invading the wall and the Pterygopalatine fossa. Four years follow up, uh, having given her radiation. As I said, she came from the Palestinian Authority. So once we discovered that this is a grade two um, meningioma and we knew that it was aggressive, then um, this, look at this picture here 
with a very good cosmetic appearance and good control of the tumor. She went back to uh, Palestine where she received treatment in Tel Aviv by Roberto Spiegelman who gave her radiation using Novalis. So this is the follow-up of this patient, post-op and the frequent follow-ups that we, we had with very good uh, result. <coughs> Sorry. Again, comparison between uh, comparison between pre-op and post-op. It did not completely resolve, but this is a very good uh, improvement. Another case, this lady from Saudi, from Saudi Arabia with this tumor involving the bone, here involving the carotid anterior cerebral middle cerebral, and the opening of the severe orbital fissure, and it's drilling. Another case who came from Yemen with this proptosis on the right side, extensive tumor involving the temporalis muscle. Again, the bony involvement and look at the middle cerebral being pushed up. And this is immediate post-op and it was a grade two. And the follow-up, we gave her radiation and this is the follow-up about uh, four years after that with very good results. Another case from the United Arab Emirates, 42 year old female lady with this tumor. As you can see, and this is the post-operative and follow-up with very good cosmetic and the reconstruction result. This patient from Iraq, from Baghdad, 51 year old patient with this shin orbital meningioma. Again, the post-operative reconstruction and the resolution of the proptosis. Another case from Kurdistan, Iraq, 46 year old female lady with this extensive tumor and the uh, result afterwards. This man came to us from Libya with the death somebody having a go at his tumor. He had actually this sphenoorbital orbital meningioma and the supracellular meningioma that were connected together. Somebody actually did surgery on him without mentioning the name of the hospital or the, the country, but what they have achieved is just to uh, damage the temporal lobe here and leave the tumor as it is. And again, this is the take home message. If you don't have the experience, don't touch these patients. So we did surgery for him and we removed the, uh, the tumor from the supraorbital, from the supracellular and from the orbits. As you can see how extensive it is. And this is the result. This patient from Syria, again with this extensive tumor and the proptosis, and again the postoperative MRIs. Again, this patient from Kurdistan, Iraq, with this extensive tumor involving mainly the orbital roof and the lateral wall and the post-operative. This patient came to us from Oman. Again, somebody had gone, had uh, a go at her. Sorry, but without much success. And uh, this was the tumor. So we went in and did the surgery. And this was in grade three and we have also to give radiation. This patient, a Jordanian uh, who works uh, here in the United Nations, uh, with this uh, proptosis on the left side, as you can see the tumor there. And this is the post-operative without any complications. And this is the follow-up in different stages. Let me show you now a couple of videos and then we are off. First video. In each video, I will show you certain pertinent features of the surgery and what are we doing rather than just show you one case. It's uh, better to show different videos and what is the lesson that we learn from each video. This is again drilling the uh, sphenoid. This is frontal, this is temporal, this is sphenoid wing, and this is drilling, and this is middle meningeal. Here you are separating the temporal 
dura from the uh, sphenoidal and also the frontal dura from the roof of the orbit, drilling here as much as you can. Irrigation is a must, of course, to prevent any heat damage. And once you uh, go through the roof of the orbit, then you can use the rough carison to complete the job for you. Here we are using it to continue the decompression. I used to, I love to use the drill until the, there's a very thin shell of bone and then uh, remove it with the left carousel. Having done that, you open the dura and then remove the tumor from intradurally. Here is the drilling of the anterior climate that's been done. This is what is left of it and this is the optic canal. So you continue the ring until you open the spirit orbital fissure and you open the optic canal. If you don't do this, you have not done a good job. Here is the severe orbital fissure. So this is the greater wing of a sphenoid coming here. Here is the ring of the anterior clinoid. This is the optic canal being opened completely. So you can see here, the optic nerve, intracranially, and the optic nerve within the canal. This is olfactory tract. Taking the arachnoid between the optic nerve and the carotid, and this is the final appearance. Okay. Surgery number two, as I said, sometimes when you turn the flab, you'll find that a big chunk of the tumor is uh, coming out with the bone flap and you have to drill that uh, completely until you come to a reasonably healthy uh, bone. I usually take one, 1.5 centimeter as a safety margin to make sure that there's no tumor left. Some of the reported cases that you will find the tumor um, meningioma cells two to three centimeters away from where they are. Here is the yellowish appearance of this sphenoid wing, which does not look healthy and it is really hot. This is frontal, separating frontal dura from the roof of the orbit. Here we are separating the timbral dura from the sphenoid wing. Again, here drilling of this awfully looking uh, sphenoid wing with a tumor inside it. Again, we don't use the word hyperostosis. This is a tumor within frontal, temporal, Everything is stuck together, uh, finding great difficulty trying to separate them. Look at this, how much the dura is involved here. Again, doing the same trick, drill it until it is thin, then use the love carison, and then continue with the drilling every time you find a thick bone. You can see here the bone is a little bit softer because it is really invaded by the tumor, but in other areas it is firm, again invaded by the tumor. Still, this is the sphenoid wing. We have not opened the spear orbital fissure here. Here we are coming closer to drilling the greater wing of sphenoid. This is lateral, this is medial. So we are drilling and trying to remove the last piece of bone separating the orbit from the uh, anterior uh, dura of the temporal lobe. Drilling of the anterior clinoid process. <clears throat> it's a tedious process, but you have to be patient. Uh, with these humans, uh, time doesn't matter. It's the job that you want to do. And here again, continue the job until removal of at least all the tumor appearing containing uh, bone. This orbit, this is timber. Here I'm trying to open the Superior orbital fissure, which is not open yet. For me, this is essential step of the surgery to open the severe orbital fissure. And here, starting to open it, this is the severe orbital fissure, anterior clinoid, the lateral wing of sphenoid. So, this is the severe orbital fissure connecting the temporal with the orbital uh, content, trying to remove more of the bone, trying to open more of the severe orbital fissure. 
<laughs> if you don't do that, then you have not done any good job for the patient. Here's the severe orbital fissure is almost completely open. And you can see the bluish color, which is most likely is the, uh, where the severe, or the severe ophthalmic vein uh, goes through. Again, drilling the anterior clinoid on the optic canal, as we have seen in the previous case. But these are essential parts of the surgery. And then once you do that, then you go enter the durally. Remember, we have seen the angiogram of this lady with this middle cerebral uh, artery and superficial middle cerebral vein being pushed up by the tumor. This is the tumor here. And then we go and try to separate these vascular structures from so it's a tricky, a tricky tumor wherever you go, intradurally or extradurally, inside the orbit or outside it, uh, this is a tricky tumor. And then you separate these by holding the arachnoid. This is a trick that uh, we all learned from Majid Sami. Uh, whether you are dealing with an acoustic neuroma or with a tumor, you can really dissect the arachnoid towards the vascular, towards the normal structures away from the uh, tumor. So removal of whatever left of the tumor there. Still there is a piece of a tumor here attached to the superficial middle cerebral vein, which is going into the sphenoparietal sinus here through several branches. Okay, I think, I think we have that. Yeah, this is a very quick one test to show you that we have opened the severe orbital fissure and the optic canal. This is the severe orbital fissure. This is the optic canal. And we have drilled all of the sphenoid wing. This is temporal, this is frontal, severe orbital fissure, the optic canal. So it's the same principles, whatever surgery you are doing, whatever patient you are doing, it's the same steps. Last video and will be done. Again, drilling, the same principles, drilling. This is frontal, this is temporal. Drilling of the uh, sphenoid wing. Dissecting the temporal dura of the temporal bone and dissecting also the frontal dura from the roof of the orbit. Again, having drilled, made the bone very thin, you opened the severe orbital fissure and the optic canal. Open the dura, go in, reflect the dura flaps, until a clinoid. Here is the optic canal. This is optic nerve, and this is the optic canal being opened. This is falciform ligament, removal of the, of the remnants of the anterior clinoid. Completing the opening of the optic canal, opening the dura of the optic canal, not only the falciform ligament, but the dura of the optic canal. Again, this is essential part of the surgery. There are still some of remnants of the anterior clinoid, you drill it from inside and then remove the last piece, which as I said, the, this is the most difficult part because this is just lying on top of the carotid in the cavernous sinus roof. Here is the carotid there. So as I said, the same principles apply to all these tumors here. I'm opening the distal ring around the carotid so that also I make sure that there is no tumor left there. And here is the third nerve going into the oculomotor triangle. Okay, with this I finish and I thank you for listening. I'm happy to take your comments and questions. Uh, last, uh, before we leave, is the discharge summary. This is our routine discharge summary. It is not a flimsy piece of paper. We mentioned everything that we have done for the patient, every detail in figures and numbers and the recommendation that we give. In conclusion, I believe strongly personally that aggressive removal is critical for a favorable outcome. 
And I believe that sometimes you have to remove a tumor, especially in the orbital apex or the cavernous sinus. Then in this case, you will give radiotherapy. Uh, and uh, that, as I said, that when large parts of the orbital roof or lateral wall and the orbit are missing, then you may need to do some reconstruction. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, hi, Dr. Sbeh. Hello. Uh, I'm Sami Khatib. Hello. Thank you. For, I'm, I'm Sami Khatib. Are you hearing me? Yes, I can. Yeah, I'm Sami Khatib, radiation oncologist. Uh, thank you for the excellent lecture. And just to say hi from the Dead Sea, uh, the lowest point in the world, and uh, very close to the baptism and the Holy Land of Palestine. And uh, regarding your lecture, uh, just I would like to confirm that uh, radiation therapy never should be used up front as a neoadjuvant treatment for meningioma. And the most effective uh, radiation therapy is only on the residual tumor. True. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. I can't hear you. John, I can't hear you. Can I hear you? Testing one, two. Okay, you hear now? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Terrell, did you hear? Did you hear any of uh, Dr. Spade's presentation? I know you did. Had you mentioned you had problems? Can you hear me? Okay, Dr. Terrell. Kiki, can you hear? Okay, <laughs> having problems. That's okay. That's okay. Okay, uh, it's open for panelists' comments or questions from some of the panelists. Uh, now's your chance. Hello, Adnan. Do you, do you have anything to say to Dr. Sabaya? You Hello. usually have a question or two. Yes, yes, Grimmy. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. yes. So you can you can hear Dr. Terrell? Yes. Huh. yes. Well, I, I guess yes. he's on a phone call. Uh, okay, Adnan, do you have any comments or questions okay. for? Okay. Uh, I'll be sitting and preparing the Thanks, lecture tomorrow. Uh, Dr. John, uh, Professor Ibrahim, as usual, wonderful lecture once again. Thank you. And uh, very nice presentation. You have organized very well everything. It was very a lot to learn from this uh, presentation. Just I have one question. Uh, if there is hyperostatic bone, as you have shown in case two or three, I think so, uh, is there any need to, for reconstruction after surgery? If you, if you achieve Simpson 1 grading in most of the cases uh, in spheno orbital meningiomas, you, do you prefer for reconstruction, orbital reconstruction? Or no, no. As I said, even in cases where the orbital was open, I follow the recommendation of Joseph Maron. I don't do reconstruction of the orbit, but I just put the fixation for the bone of the uh, bone flap of the tumoral bone, but not for the orbit. So I don't, I rarely yeah. use to do the reconstruction for the orbit. I was uh, reading a paper a uh, few days back about the titanium uh, plate reconstruction and they use they they show that it's a, it was a paper of 2011 and yeah. they they say it's very good for that. Uh, I use the titanium that. I use the titanium mesh for reconstruction. As I said, if there was a really big bony removal and if there is pretty orbital invasion then I use this. So titanium mesh is the preferred type of reconstruction. Okay, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. Okay. Um, Dr. Kabula, welcome from the Congo. How are you doing, Dr. Kabula? Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, perhaps he stepped away. Okay, any other comments or questions for Dr. Sabaya? This is your chance.
I hope everyone doesn't stay quiet. A large part of this technology is just feeling comfortable with it and using it. Uh, at first, uh, Dr. Um, Abu Bakr, how you been? Can you hi, hear John, me? Can I ask some questions? Oh, go ahead, Rupesh, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, hello, Professor Ibrahim, how are you doing? Hello. Welcome. Thank you, John. Um, sorry, uh, it was a good presentation again. I usually like the way you present. You start with the uh, anatomy, the statistics. You proceed with the, all the differential diagnosis and your operative videos. So I have a few questions. Uh, first one, you uh, told us that you do angiography, venography, and even isotopes in your uh, patients preoperatively. Do you select your patients for these or you do these investigations for all the patients? Okay, let me take them one, one question at a time. I don't do isotope for all patients. I only do isotope if they have some doubts in my mind about the differential diagnosis. And isotope is good for the cases of uh, histocytosis, X and the others. But for the others, like the angiogram and venogram, it is essential part of the investigations. So for me, CT scan, MRI, MRA, MRB are one and the same units. Right. Sir. Um, sir, I would like to know about the blood supply of these uh, sphenoorbital meningiomas. Is it sure. also a memory? Yes, of course. You would expect that the most concerns, uh, blood supply coming from the anterothmoid, the steroid and sometimes directly branches from the steroid communicating from the carotid artery, and in general branch of the carotid artery and so on. So they are really vascular. Depending on the uh, source of their arterial supply, sir, have you ever tried a pre-op embolization in your patients? No, I don't believe in pre-operative embolization except in very, very large, hugely large um, meningiomas in other sites like parasagittal or in the pseudofossa because embolization, uh, not only by my recommendation, but by recommendations of great people like Bernard George, he would tell you that don't do it unless it is necessary. By the recommendations of uh, Jihad Nsimi, that he would mm -hmm. tell you, don't do embolization until it is necessary. So maybe 2% of cases you need embolization. The rest you don't. Embolization carries a risk, especially if people don't know the exact blood supply. Sometimes people would go for embolization of the external carotid, and then one branch from the ascending pharyngeal will go into the uh, vascular structures of the brain stem and cause major damage. So extra procedure, extra complication for no good benefit. And I always refer to Jahan Hanisemi recommendation here. Have a patient of a cow dealing with the brain tumor. You have to devascularize and be patient and then you will succeed. If you are in a hurry, if your idea of embolization is to decrease the blood supply, to decrease the time of operation, you are mm -hmm. mistaken. Mm -hmm. Right. So thank you so much for your valuable comments. Thank you. Okay. Okay. To Dr. Sabaya, we have a question from Swatandra Mishra. He asked, any immobilization prior to surgery and any recommendations? Any mobilization of what? Prior to surgery. Any Im uh, immobilization prior to it's surgery. Immobilization. Yeah, the same question. It's about immobilization before surgery. I don't do it except in very, very rare cases. So I don't do preoperative embolization. Okay, I guess I'm sorry I didn't hear that question. Okay, uh, uh, more comments, questions from the panelists? Dr. Dr. Abubakar, Hello. welcome, welcome. Yeah, I welcome Dr. Bennett after a long time. Yeah, uh, nice to see you. <laughs> and also to Prof. Sebeh, my friend, uh, Brian Sebeh. And uh, as usual, he's very precise and very informative. I'm very meticulous in tackling such complicated problems. And also my greetings to Professor Kiki Torel. Uh, I have uh, only one question for uh, Sibeh. Please. Uh, do you used to have any uh, frozen sections during the operation to differentiate whether this is uh, Great as a grade of the meningioma, if it is helpful in that uh, uh, situation. And if you have uh, any residual uh, tumor, in which is grade uh, one, do you proceed to radiotherapy or do you leave it for conservative follow up only? Thank you. Sure. Uh, we always do a, a frozen section during surgery, but remember that these tumors are made of two parts. 
the soft part, which is intracranial, intradural, and the bony part. So even if you send a specimen for the soft part and the result came back as a grade one meningioma, doesn't mean the end of the story because the part within the bone needs at least 10 days of decalcification before the histopathologist will give you a result. So as a rule, I go for radical excision, whether it is a grade one or two or three, I just proceed till the end until I have no more space to remove, and then I stop. And then if it comes back as a grade two or three, then I would give radiation immediately. Did and that answer the question? Go only, ahead. If it is only grade one and they have residual tumor, do you have uh, any other given uh, treatment for it or you just follow it? For a grade one, I just follow them. Grade one surgery, residual, I follow them. Did you, did you hear that, Dr. Abu Bakr? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Abu Bakr is a neurosurgeon from Sudan. That's where you're currently at now, right, Dr. Abu Bakr? Yes, yes, I'm still in Sudan, but uh, so I'm still in local, in local <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, we used to have a grand rounds, Dr. Sabaya from Sudan. Uh, we hope we pick it up soon with uh, Mogi and company. Uh, but we'll see. Okay, any com more comments or questions from any of the panelists? The question here that I read, what are the percentages oh, okay. of yeah, okay. individual deterioration after surgery? It is reported in my series, I had uh, three cases of visual deterioration after one of them was permanent, two were temporary. But in general, this is the, the, the consensus of opinion regarding visual deterioration after surgery. In good hands, it should be very minimal. Very good. Okay, very good, Dr. Sabay. We'd like to thank you for taking the time for excellent teaching. Uh, any any uh, idea on the topic next week? I'm thinking swinging between two. There's a question here from Dr. Abdullah Zidan. Oh, okay. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Ibrahim. Kif Hello. I'm see. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm well, premature. Uh, well, actually, <laughs> uh, actually, Dr. Ibrahim is a, is a mentor and a friend of mine, and I'm really proud of him. Well, uh, we have met some cases of uh, uh, meningiomas on black uh, with uh, plenty of fibrostosis. And as you have shown in plenty of your cases that there are involvement of the bone. Uh, well, sometimes uh, we have involvement of the bone which reaches to the, uh, too far in the base of the skull and the temporal bone and the, uh, around the whole orbit in areas which is really very difficult to reach. Uh, what's, what, what is your plans for such cases, uh, especially if it is a little bit uh, approved to be uh, type 2 or 3 meningiomas? How can you deal with such far extensions of such tumor, mainly? Sure. I don't, I don't care whether, whether the histology came back as grade 1 or 2 or 3 during surgery, because as I said, there are two parts, the soft part and the, the bony part. You don't know what's the outcome of this one part. They cannot give you an answer unless they do the decalcification within 10 days. So to me, this is a meningioma that I need to remove as much as I can. I want to go as radical as I can. But there are limitations, not my recommendations, but the recommendations of others. Go after any piece of the tumor that you can remove, even if it is in the floor of the middle fossa, even if it is in the very lateral part of the sphenoid vein. Uh, remove the dura, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But tumors left in the apex of the of the orbit or going into the cavernous sinus, you better leave. So I would go for radical excision, regardless of the grade. But I would leave a tumor where I cannot remove, or where removal of this tumor would cause major complications, like a cavernous sinus or the apex of the orbit. What about what about the bony parts, which is specifically in the in the meningiomas in black. That's what I'm saying, that even in the floor of the middle fossa, you go and drill it. And even if you reach to the foramen of valley or rotundum uh, or spinosum, you just drill that and open it and widen it. 
and this has been very elegantly presented in the paper of William Caldwell from Salt Lake City. Uh, what do you think about uh, some strategy therapy or focus therapy in such areas? As I said, if it is a grade one, I would follow them. Grade two and three, I would give radiation immediately. I don't wait. Okay, very good. Okay, more comments or closing question from any of the panelists? I don't want to end prematurely again. Uh, let's see. Okay, Dr. Sevea. Uh, thank you. Thank I'd you. like to thank you again very much. And uh, we'll see everyone next week, hopefully. Uh, hopefully. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, sorry Kiki, it didn't work uh, for you ne next week. Bye bye. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.